I'm your host, Fatima Sese. We've all heard about the Ebola outbreak that's currently affecting Africa, but how much do we really know about the disease and the precautions needed to contain it? Today on the show, Mr. Sidiq Y of the United African Congress will give more insights and update on what he has been doing here in the diaspora to help the situation. Also joining me today in the studio is Dr. Mofudia Bangura, currently practicing in New Jersey. All that and a lot coming your way on this special coverage of the Ebola outbreak in Africa. Coming up is the street trivia in which I ask New Yorkers if they've heard about the Ebola virus and their personal opinions about it. I think it's scary. Scary? Yeah. I think that it's very scary that something like that could just come and wipe, you know, like, I just think that it's scary that, and I mean, then I've been reading different things, so I'm a little confused on it. One, we don't have a cure for it. One, mm -hmm. we don't, can't really, you can treat the symptoms, but if you're going to pass from it, you're going to pass from it. There's not much we can do as of this point. Um, as for the outbreak, we have to contain it before it gets further, or else it's just going to keep spreading at this rate. I don't know, where, where, did, where did it come from? And can it, it can be spread. Well, I thought at first that the situation was, was going to be really dangerous, but from what I've been like reading and, and seeing in the news lately, it seems like it's pretty much under control, and it's uh, the, I guess the pandemic is limited to uh, like a, a few countries in Africa, but it, it seems like uh, the, this, the, I don't know if it was the CDC or the equivalent of the CDC that, that responded. I live in Jackson, like I said, and I found out that a city away from me, someone came home with it. What? And I mean, it's a scary feeling because I'm about to get married and I'm about to move into the same city. So I'm really worried. That is a deadly disease and a whole bunch of people died back in Africa in the sad. I think there's so many undercover things that we really don't know about. So and then I'm like, where did Ebola come from? Is that something that they just, you know, made up as well? Like. HIV, so, you know. I think that it could be very addictive, uh, very contagious, but I don't think they're going to let it come to the United States very soon. It's living here, I don't, I don't feel like uh, I'm, I'm really in danger. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that, I mean, the, the U.S. And, and, and the European countries as well, like, step in to, uh, to, uh, to, to help out, yeah, as soon as possible. What I really think about it, I really think it's a disease like any other thing. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, especially in New York, mm -hmm. we have a lot of resources mm -hmm. to deal with it. Exactly. That means a uh, disease mm -hmm. has heart disease, for instance, mm -hmm. but this one is uh, contagious. That's exactly. why people uh, are so afraid about it. Mm -hmm. But we were totally afraid of HIV as well. Exactly. And we are working on it. So do you think it's a government conspiracy or do you think it's a natural occurrence? No, I, I, it's, it's a natural. I, I, most of the time it ends up being a government conspiracy. <laughs> Somebody was playing up in the laboratory and they came up with something that they couldn't get rid of. Like I think that it's all a part of the whole medicine um, business. Mm -hmm. I think that, like, you know, money is generated through the medications that is made for the different... There's so many diseases that I'm like, why can't they get rid of that? You know, I think that it would put the pharmacies and, you know, all of that out of business if they didn't allow things to keep on going. And then there's so much population that I feel like they make up things to get rid of the population. Of exactly. Hmm, you never know. Maybe it is a government conspiracy, and I do believe in it. So, yes, a government conspiracy. Oh, really? I think it's man-made. Our government in particular? I wouldn't believe so. It's okay. starting in what? Western Africa. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if someone has an agenda over there, but don't bring it over here. Don't bring But they <laughs> want the doctor. They are. I mean, yeah. he's contained. He's, he's in a contained room, and he's either going to make it through or he's going to die. And as long as no one else gets it after that, then you're fine. I wouldn't think it, uh, someone would just randomly want to kill this many people. I think it's, it's something that has never been found and now it has come come up and now we're getting it from all over. I think it's a natural occurrence eating the bad meat that they eat over there and stuff like that. How could this we'll see with the government? What type of government do you have to go on? I want to attribute government conspiracy to it. No, you wouldn't, no, you would? I would not. I would okay. not. I would not. The <laughs> hospital we have, the healthcare people we have, we are strong enough to take care of any disease. I agree. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you to you too.
Welcome back. Joining me right now is Dr. Mafudia Soiree, who was born and raised in Sierra Leone, where she started her medical education. She and her family migrated to the United States following the Civil War and currently resides in New Jersey, where she also works. Dr. Soiree has a dual degree in medicine and a master's degree in public health. She's currently a faculty member at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and practices both hospital medicine and office-based primary care medicine. Since the start of the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, she's been involved in raising awareness and providing education about the disease in the DMV, New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia regions. She's also partnered with Doctors Without Borders to raise funds in support of their efforts in managing the outbreak. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Suare. Thank you for having me on Fatima. So tell me, what is the Ebola virus? So the Ebola virus um, is a disease that is not common to human beings and naturally, as far as we know, lives in fruit bags but from time to time will get into the primate and the human population and cause um, serious disease outbreaks like the Ebola virus disease outbreak that we're currently experiencing in West Africa. Okay, so how is it transmitted? So the main mode of transmission for Ebola virus is through contact with body fluids of someone who is infected with Ebola. Okay. Um, if you take it way back from the fruit bat, you know, it can go from the fruit bat to primates, so like, you know, large animals like, you know, monkeys and chimpanzees and animals like that. If they get in contact with the fruit bat, you know, either, you know, through eating it or getting in contact with something that the bat has eaten that is contaminated with the bat saliva. But from the animals to the human beings, it can happen through exposure of, to the blood fluids or the, the blood of the animals. So, you know, eating on, you know, improperly cooked bush meat or, you know, handling bush meat and then getting that blood on you could put, you know, could cause it to go from the animals to the human beings. Once you get a person infected with Ebola virus, mm -hmm. it transmits um, easily from person to person through exposure of bodily fluids. So for example, someone with Ebola has diarrhea and you come in contact with, you know, that uh, fluid from the diarrhea, then mm -hmm. it can, you know, it can get transmitted to that person. Wow. And the body fluids that, you know, that carry the virus, you know, include saliva, include tears, include, um, you know, urine, um, it includes um, stool, and even includes semen. Wow. Interesting. So what are the symptoms of Ebola? So the, the primary, the initial symptom is fever. Mm -hmm. And then you also have severe body pains, severe fatigue, vomiting, diarrhea, and that can progress to vomiting blood or having, you know, bloody diarrhea. And in the end stages, people can actually have internal and external bleeding before they die. So I know they say there's no treatment for Ebola, but there, there are um, drugs that are currently being developed or are being experimented. How do you feel about those drugs being sent to Africa, especially I think they were sent to Liberia currently, um, recently? How do you feel about that? So, you know, obviously when you find out about experimental treatment, it, I personally have mixed feelings about it. Okay. Um, on one hand, I'm happy that there are drugs that are being tested and are being developed for this disease that up till you know up till this outbreak we were not aware of any of there was no you know approved treatment mm. or approved vaccine prior to this time and there's still nothing that is fda approved mm -hmm. um but at least now we know that there are drugs and vaccines that are in development even though they hadn't been tested widely but they at least had shown promise in lab testing and initial small human testing so that is promising and that, you know, that makes me feel hopeful that there's a potential for, you know, a actual, for an actual cure for this. I think there's a, a serum being developed, whether it's ethical to use it on Africans. It's as if Africans are being used as guinea pigs. You know, how do you feel about that? Do you think they should use that on Th there's, uh, there's a lot of <laughs> ethical issues surrounding the Ebola outbreak and management of the Ebola outbreak. Okay. Um, if you look at, you know, what the international laws and, you know, and, you know, laws in developed countries about using experimental treatment, mm -hmm. they, they're really not encouraged to use experimental treatment. 
Um, that's why there's a system for testing, you know, new treatments. Um, you know, in the United States, the FDA is in charge mm -hmm. of making sure that drug companies go through a series of clinical trials and tests to make sure that the drug is, you know, does what they claim it, you know, it does. Mm -hmm. It's going to cause more good and the harm is going to be significantly less compared to the benefits. And, you know, and it's tested on increasingly larger numbers of people to see what all the possible side effects are before the final decision is made to license it and start selling it. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to do that, it requires a lot of money, a lot of testing, and this thing takes time. Um, even in the United States, there are times when they allow compassionate use of experimental treatment in cases where there's no cure for a particular illness and okay. someone is, you know, will die if they don't have this drug and this drug has a potential. Um, there have exactly. been exceptions for compassionate use, so there's a precedent for that. Now, when you talk about an outbreak in a resource poor country, the ethical dilemma becomes you know, who can really afford it? And is this, is this drug only going to be used, you know, is this outbreak going to be used as, um, as a trial, in a mm -hmm. sense, an uh, unofficial clinical trial? We'll see what the drug does in this population. And then at the end of the day, when the mm -hmm. outbreak is over, will these people still be able to access this drug if they need it? So let's say they use, you know, ZMAP, for example, in this, you know, Ebola outbreak, mm -hmm. and it works and a lot of people, you know, get, you know, cured because of ZMAP. The outbreak ends, say in five years, there's another Ebola outbreak. Will this government be able to get ZMAP for their people? Mm -hmm. Will this drug companies make ZMAP affordable for these countries to be able to purchase in the event of another outbreak? That's where the ethical issues come up. And that's why even in the United States, you know, the ethical laws, you know, that are developed are set up so that you don't unfairly use a set of people to test a medication, a drug, a treatment, whatever it is, exactly. if they're not going to benefit from it later on and exactly. somebody else is going to benefit. So, there, you know, there are ethical issues about that. You mentioned the, the, um, the two Americans that got the drug. They were... They were given the serum while they were still in Liberia, and then they were flown, from what I understand, you know, reading in the news, they were okay. given the drug while they were still in Liberia, and then they were brought to, you know, to the United States and monitored, you know, to see how they were doing. There are certain international laws that do not allow the use of um, experimental treatment without the approval of that government. I don't okay. know how it was set up in Liberia, personally. I don't, okay. you know, I don't know if the Liberia government was aware that you know the drug was you know actually administered while you know while the people were in Liberia, um, so this is all what I'm just getting from the news that it's coming in. But you know, so those are questions that always need to be asked and you know need to be looked at. Um, and I don't you know at this point in time, I don't think that should be a focal issue, but it's something that should not be like brushed off to the side. I know you went back to Sierra Leone not too long ago. So tell me about your experience. I know back even then, the Ebola outbreak was there. Tell me about that. Yeah, so I was in Sierra Leone um, in mid to late June, okay. and it was still early on in the um, Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. It'd been going on in Guinea for a few months at that point, um, and starting up in Liberia. And um, I'd gone for personal, you know, family, you know, reasons. But obviously, while I was there, I wanted to find out what people knew about Ebola and get a sense of how prepared, you know, people were in different parts. And I, you know, I spent time in the city and I spent time in Bo and even in Kenema, which you know has become, you know, the epicenter exactly. now of the Ebola virus um, outbreak. And um, at, at that time, it was really disconcerting and frightening to me to realize that a lot of people were in total denial or totally unaware of hmm. what was going on in the eastern part of the country. And this is specifically talking about the city in Freetown. Um, you know, for anyone who's been to Sierra Leone, you, you know, it, it's not hard to imagine. There's usually a disconnect between the city and what's going on in the rest of the country. Exactly. Um, and, and that was going on. And even when I went to, you know, the south and the eastern part of the country, there was a lot of denial, even among family members, you know, when I talked to them about, you know, I was like, this thing is real and this disease is out there and people are dying from it. And, <laughs> you know, people brush it off all, and, of you know, course. they had a lot of, you know, problems with it, you know, cause they hadn't seen anyone. They didn't personally know someone who died from Ebola. So seeing is believing for a lot of, you know, for exactly. a lot of people. <laughs> and so 
they didn't believe um and i had a you know a hard time you know talking to family members and trying to educate them about this um before i came back to the united states and that really is what spurred me on when i came back um to really embark on an education campaign and awareness campaign for Sierra unions in the diaspora because we have the air of our family back at home we send money every month we support you know family back at home pretty much every Sierra union or every african here exactly. supports somebody back home and so they listen to you and so one of the major things that i've been doing is trying to get the air of africans especially west africans in the diaspora say pick up the phone call your family member if you call six family members and tell them this disease is for real ebola virus disease is for real it's not made up it's killing people these are the symptoms fever body aches um, diarrhea vomiting bleeding if you have the symptoms seek medical attention you know avoid contact with anyone who has the symptoms and if you've been in contact with someone who's been known to have Ebola, you need to make the health authorities aware so that they can monitor you in case you do develop symptoms so you can get tested and see whether or not you have Ebola. And that's really my basic message that I've been trying to pass on to you know Africans in the diaspora. If somebody wants to get in contact with you or you know seek medical help, you just mentioned some of the ways. What are other ways that they can do so? So uh, it depends. If you're talking about in Sierra Leone, Okay. Both. So if people are in Sierra Leone and, you know, and they're concerned about exposure to Ebola, or they're concerned about that they might have symptoms that are consistent with Ebola, the government has um, you know, national hotlines basically that have been set up. Okay. And those numbers are posted. I do know one of the numbers is a three-digit number, 117. Okay. Um, and there are other local numbers that are, you know, all over the country. And, and you dial that number and you get the, the local um, health response team. And they're in charge of, you know, tracing contacts and getting people with symptoms to the right places where they can get the medical attention that they need, whether it's screening, isolation, um, whatever it is. Um, in the United States, of course, I'm not personally taking care of people yeah. patients because we don't have those, you know, here. But, you know, if someone wants, you know, question, you know, has a question about, you know, about the outbreak or, you know, have concerns about it. Um, I do have a website that just went um, on live and it's www.africanhealthnetwork.com. Okay. And you can, you know, contact me through, you know, through that, send an email um, through that and, you know, respond to, you know, to questions. And there's been a lot of community um, meetings that have been going on. Um, get towards both you know education awareness and um, and also fundraising, um, but through my website you can get you know information about you know what events are coming up you know that I'm aware of and I post on there. Speaking of fundraising, before I forget, um, I know you partner with Doctors Without Borders, and that's what you've been doing, correct? Yeah. Raising so funds. so when I came back from Sierra Leone, um, I wanted to because at that time there was a def, uh, desperate need for funds to get medical supplies okay. um, to the country, and um, so I partnered with um, Doctors Without Borders and set up a fundraising fund specifically for the Ebola outbreak through them, and I was raising money through them. Now that campaign um, has actually just ended okay. um, because Doctors Without Borders is now fully funded for the Ebola outbreak, specifically for the Ebola right. with, you know, with the media attention and with more WHO aid and foreign aid that has been pledged, um, they've been given more, you know, more funds to deal with this uh, because they're the only you know, group, the only relief organization that's actually taking care of patients on the ground in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, and helping in Liberia um, in terms of infrastructure. That's the main okay. fundraising um, thing that I'm doing right now, and I'm planning for other fundraising activities as the situation changes and I determine what the major need is in the country, I, you know, kind of change my focus so that I best put my energy where it's, you know, most beneficial. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me today. Okay. Thank you, Fatima. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. The Ebola virus has been ravaging West Africa for some months now, especially in countries such as Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. As of Wednesday, August 13th, the World Health Organization stated that at least 2,127 people in Nigeria, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone has been infected with the virus, 
with 1,145 of those cases being fatal since the outbreak began this year. Since no proven treatment exists, doctors and health organizations are currently trying to contain the outbreak by using experimental treatment. As promised, I am sitting here with Mr. Sadiq Wai. He's the president and national spokesperson for the United African Congress. He recently ran for public advocate of New York City last year, and he's also the highest ranking African who's been in government. So thank you for joining me today, Mr. Sadiq Wai. Thank you, Fatima. Appreciate it. Yeah, so on the issue of Ebola, please tell me what have you been doing to help the issue? Well, when we heard about this Ebola epidemic, yes. um, there was so much publicity surrounding this effort. Mm -hmm. It was read in the New York Times, C CNN, CBS, NBC, ABC, New York One, which in fact they did interview me on New York One. But one of the things that actually struck me and my colleagues is that whenever tragedies occur, mm -hmm. there are always these pundits talking about it to death. And then we said, United African Congress, give them a hand foundation, mm -hmm. said, and then uh, Africa rights. We said, you know what? I think this is the most unique opportunity for the African diaspora, particularly in those affected countries of yeah. Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia to come together because they have diaspora here. So we decided that we wanted to engage the credible leaders of those countries mm -hmm. that are in government representing them. You know, of course, the talking heads are going to talk about their talking heads. Mm -hmm. But what we are saying is, that's good too. But let's do something tangible. So okay. now, so organizations. I don't mean to cut you off. Right. Um, the um, event that you're going to be holding on the 28th. What are you going to do with those resources to help back home? Well, this is this is what we are saying. Every. But who every organization that is part of this coalition, mm -hmm. we're going to hold them to very high standards because one of the things that uh, we pride ourselves in, and that which has always been the case, mm -hmm. that people have always said, oh, well, when we give things to people, they don't get to where we are. Yes. So we are going to have very strict, rigid requirements in supporting people if you are not part of this coalition, we don't certify you. We don't know what you're doing. If you're collecting anything in the name of this coalition, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that the governments that we're working with, the health professionals, the paramount chiefs, in the areas of need, that those resources that we are gathering, gloves, things that have to do with energy, mm -hmm. so that you could power these places, okay. uh, uh, that they are going in the areas that they are needed. Well, that's why we're working very closely uh, with our friends, our partners, and these partners have been very, very formidable. Friday, the Union of uh, the National Association of Sierra Leoneans mm -hmm. is having their event in Staten Island on exactly. Friday, and we are inviting everybody to go support it. And in addition to that, we also have uh, 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 Reverend Garcia and Dr. Uh, Dr. Luan Rawls okay. in, in Long Island. There is a big, huge march, uh, Ebola march being planned in which the faith-based community is joining us, you know, to be able to, to do, to bring some additional spotlight on this. But wow. whatever march we are taking place, we are also saying to people the, the, the resources that the people need has to be part of that process because at the end of the day you could have a march and if we don't have anything to give to our people exactly. then it doesn't mean anything Everything so we are talking for. about whatever program whatever activity we're going to be doing it has to have as a direct impact the resources that the people need so that we could save lives in the so you mentioned all these organizations who are 
you know, coming together to put together events out here in the diaspora. Do you know if the American government has gotten involved well, in such a way? Well, the, the, the thing that the United States government, uh, to my knowledge, has appropriated monies, okay. uh, I think either 50 or 100 million, I don't know. And also the OPEC countries just gave about half a billion dollars uh, to, the, to this effort, you know. But that's the big, the big, the big boys and the big girls. <laughs> but in addition to that, I think I give them a lot of credit. I think we are very grateful for what they're doing. But us, mm -hmm. as the sons and daughters of those countries, uh, whose families are affected by this, who we get calls every single day, we are saying to ourselves now, let us do something. The big people are doing it. But I think it will make a very, very important uh, uh, statement yes. to our people there to know that their sons and daughters did not forget them. Exactly. And that we are also doing what we can within our own limited resources. That is a commitment that we make to this effort. So you mentioned being sons and daughters of, you know, Africa. Do you have family back home? Oh, yeah. Or are they affected oh, yes. in well, any way Well, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, the, in the eastern region of Sierra Leone, uh, the Prime Chief there is my uncle. Wow. You know, uh, and also uh, my nieces have relatives in the Kailan region. Okay. So indirectly, my family is being affected because my family is involved as leaders in trying to protect the lives and properties of these people, of the people who are affected. What are they telling you? Oh, they're telling me that it's not getting better, even though the government is trying very hard and the Sierra Leone government should be credited. There's a lockdown now and, you know, they're doing what they can, but the government alone cannot do it by themselves. No. So they're saying, in addition to what the government is doing, let us don't forget them. So my message to my brothers and sisters from Sierra Leone, from Guinea, from Liberia, is that Nigeria, your Nigeria, yeah, all Ghana, of these African countries, exactly. I'm saying to them, your people are saying, don't forget them. And we have a moral obligation and responsibility to respond to that. Because if those people did not give us the opportunity, they didn't bring us into this world, we didn't come from those countries, we would not be here we would have been victims right now. Exactly. So if we could do this, uh, it's the best thing that we could do. Today, this is the, I'm announcing this on this program, <laughs> that we have now gotten a date, which is August the 28th at 4.30, in which- 4.30. 4.30 at the United Nations. We want to, first of all, organize a conference at okay. the UN. Uh, which is going to be co-hosted by these three ambassadors okay. and uh, the uh, uh, supporting organizations, United African Congress, mm -hmm. Give Them a Hand Foundation, uh, Carib News, Black Star News, wow. Africa Rights, Mandin Diamant Organization, United States of Sierra Leone National Association. Okay. All of these organizations and the organizations are growing. We are all going to be inviting everyone to come to that conference wherein these medical professionals are going to talk about educating us about Ebola. Yes. Now, in addition, mm -hmm. we are in direct contact with the people on the ground. We had a telephone conference call last week Friday in okay. which the Paramount Chiefs from Kailan District from Kenema District this is in, Sierra in Sierra Leone. They participated okay. live telling us what was happening on the ground wow. by the minute. And they were telling us specifically that with all credit to the government, the government is doing what they can, but they need help. So lastly, do you have any message for the people who have families who are, have been affected by Ebola or who are victims? and feel isolated? Well, I, the, the thing that I can say, Sierra Leone is a very small country. And if you come from the north, mm -hmm. you may have families in the south or in the east. Exactly. I come from two ruling houses, one in the north, the Bangura family there, that's my family. Okay. In the south, the, the Kaikais, the Jaj, 
the Ys, mm -hmm. that's my family down there. So we have seen the loss of lives of families, people who have lost their loved ones. Yes. And all we can say is we ask God to bless the souls of those people. But in the meantime, for those who are now suffering from this epidemic, the best thing we can do is to leave aside all of the politics, all of the other stuff, mm -hmm. and pull ourselves together as one. Exactly. To send in that message to our government, to send in that message to our families, be they in Guinea, be they in Sierra Leone, be they in Liberia, that when it comes to disasters of this nature, everybody's our family, and we care about everyone. And now, with this effort, the Sierra Leone uh, Association in Staten Island, they are doing their fundraiser on exactly. Friday. All of us should go there and support it. I agree. And then, on the 28th, we want everybody to come. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. this is not a party. This is to save lives. And those ambassadors who have given their support, those countries that we are working with, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and anywhere else that this epidemic will surface, it includes them. So I would just ask my brothers and sisters from all of these countries in the diaspora here in this country, and our friends of goodwill, to say to them, this is a fight that we could win, but we got to win it together exactly. by working together. And that's the message. Thank you very make. much. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Fatima. <laughs> Appreciate it. In closing, the question I want to ask is, will the international community step up since we now move so easily between the borders? Join me next time as I uncover more stories from inside the diaspora. Also, don't forget to like us, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at, at Inside Diaspora. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.